folks, uh, I'm Peter McKnight, and I have the pleasure of being here today with uh, Alex Henri Bargava, who is a neurologist specializing in cognitive disorders in uh, Victoria, BC. And so, um, uh, just a few uh, questions for uh, for Alex about uh, about Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. First of all, uh, we hear a lot now with the aging population about um, dementia, about Alzheimer's. Uh, could you give us a, a you know, simple layman's explanation of what dementia is and how this differs from normal aging, the kind of things that happen to people as they, as they get older cognitively. So that, that's actually an important question that even some physicians don't have a clear un understanding of. Dementia is, is not a disease in and of itself, it's just a term, mm -hmm. meaning that there's some sort of degenerative process in the brain, brain cells that are degenerating aren't working well, uh, that cause some form of change in the way a person thinks that is obvious to them and can be measured in some way by a physician or other healthcare professional and that is of sufficient impact to change the way that person can function. That's what dementia is. There's a number of different types of diseases or more appropriately pathological processes, so abnormal changes in the brain that cause dementia and the most common of those is Alzheimer's disease, which mm. is a process that was des described in 1906. Uh, but there are a number of others, and in fact, the, probably the most common is a mixture between Alzheimer's and something else as well. Mm. Right. And so how does one distinguish between that and the sort of things that happen to people, normal, normal aging, aging yeah. where they start forgetting things, how does one distinguish between that and the pathological uh, dementia? So at an in an absolute term, to be very accurate and say someone had Alzheimer's disease past tense, you can only distinguish on an autopsy when the person's passed mm. away and look at it. So when someone is uh, a living, breathing patient, we, we make a, a judgment from a, a clinical assessment and we say they have probable Alzheimer's disease or they have probable some other type of dementia. And that's based on the way in which the cognitive changes are manifesting themselves. So we mm. know that in people who if we do an autopsy later on, have Alzheimer's disease, there's a certain way in which their memory will decline that is different than the normal declines in memory. Because there, are, there is a normal decline in memory, unfortunately, that happens to all of us as we age. Where that starts isn't very clear. Some studies suggest it starts as early as 30. Other studies suggest it happens later on, maybe towards the age of 60. But all of us will experience some degree of age-related uh, memory decline. But in Alzheimer's disease, that decline is going to be much more precipitous. And in, in most of the people who have the more typical manifestation of that Alzheimer's disease, the way in which the memory decline declines in such a way that the, the doctor assessing the patient could say, well, this is not normal. Mm. Early on, it's, it could be a difficult thing to distinguish, actually. Right. Okay. Now, as I understand it, research has shown us that, that you know, you talked about the changes in the brain, and, 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 and research has shown that some people can have what would look like the brain of an Alzheimer's patient and yet be functioning relatively normally. Mm -hmm. do, we, do we understand what's going on there? Why it is some people can have these problems in their brain, yet they're able to function? I, I don't think we fully understand it because actually this is something that has only really uh, come to light quite recently into how prevalent that notion can be, that someone... Uh, can be cognitively normal uh, on all pen and paper tests and when you talk to their families and they're functioning totally fine uh, but yet now that we can have ways of looking and finding some of those Alzheimer's changes using sophisticated mainly research related imaging techniques we're finding as you said that they have the changes of Alzheimer's that have accumulated. One possibility, and, and, and it's probably true in many cases, is we're, what we're learning from other studies is that the changes of Alzheimer's disease, those abnormal changes in the brain, predate the onset of symptoms by several years. Mm -hmm. And so there's an idea that your brain can compensate to those changes for quite some time, and it requires a certain burden of changes before your brain is overwhelmed and it produces symptoms. And so possibly the patients who have Alzheimer's changes but are normal are still early on in that accumulation of changes so that they haven't yet shown mm -hmm. problems. And in fact, this is where drug companies are trying to investigate whether drugs might work in that population of people to prevent the onset of Alzheimer's if we know that they're already having some of the changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. Another possibility is that what we now consider the changes of Alzheimer's disease may be only part of the disease 
and there may be other changes that need to happen at the same time to really produce the disease, mm. and we haven't figured out what those are yet. Because mm. remember, as I said, that Alzheimer's disease, how we determine it when we look at it on a brain, that, that definition hasn't changed very much since 1906. And so there are other changes that are happening in the brain that may need to be happen on top of the changes that Dr. Alzheimer mm. described. Um, and then yet a, a third possibility is that there may be some people who have protective mechanisms so that they're developing Alzheimer's changes, but their brains are more resilient to those changes than the average individual. Right, right I see. So now, so now the, I think the million dollar question, which, which, which people are interested in is, uh, as I say, we have an aging population. Uh, many people are, are getting to the age where, where you know, they need to they concern themselves with this. What is it that people can do to decrease the chances of their developing Alzheimer's, or, or can they do that? So that's actually the $600 billion question because okay. that's the cost of taking care of um, patients with Alzheimer's disease in the, develop, in the developed world. Um, we are, we're starting to find out that there are things that we can do uh, on an average basis. It doesn't mean that if you do all these things, you're, not, you're guaranteed not to develop Alzheimer's. And I think that's an important thing to take home. Mm -hmm. But that on average, uh, things that are healthy for your body are actually healthy for your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, old saying healthy a healthy mind and a healthy body but we actually have some empirical proof now that that actually leads to a delay or even possibly a prevention of the onset of Alzheimer's disease so for example engaging in a combination of aerobic and resistive exercise seems to be quite robustly across a number of different ways it's been studied helps to delay the onset of Alzheimer's engaging in socially stimulating activity in mid and late life prevents the development of Alzheimer's disease Engaging in mentally stimulating activities such as arts and crafts uh, in midlife and maintaining that engagement through to late life seems to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And generally, working your brain and training your brain seems to, to help. People who speak more than one language, people who, who play a musical instrument, for example, have a delayed onset or, or perhaps a prevention onset of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. There are genetic risks that play into all of this, and, and we know few of them and we don't know many of them and so someone could exercise right uh, could be mentally stimulated could be socially stimulated and still could have Alzheimer's disease unfortunately mm -hmm. and so it's important not to say that if people develop this condition it's because of something they did but if we want to put the odds on our on our side those are some of the things that we can do. Right. Now I noticed a couple of times you mentioned delayed mm -hmm. the onset of Alzheimer's and, and prevention do we know uh, whether we can actually prevent it, or is it just a matter of delaying? It's, it's a hard question to answer because the incidence of Alzheimer's disease increases exponentially with age. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, there is many more people who will develop Alzheimer's at the age of 85 than at the age of 80. If we can delay that by even five years, we've actually pushed beyond the average life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that those people will actually die of natural causes or something else, mm -hmm. and, and by all intents and purposes, we've actually prevented it. Uh, so that's where, and, and many of the studies don't, we don't have many, many studies that have looked at someone from the day they were born to the day they died, because you can imagine that's a 90 year study and, and our science has changed a lot in, in that time. Mm -hmm. So we, we infer things based on cross-sectional studies or on short longitudinal studies, and that's why we often talk about delay rather than prevention, because right. the only way to prove prevention is to have a group of people that we study right up until they die. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, well, that's, that's uh, wonderfully helpful. Thank you very much, to, uh, Dr. Alex Alvary Bhagava, uh, for, for your help in us uh, understanding dementia and Alzheimer's. My pleasure. Thanks.